With our pastor, Dr. Walter Malone Jr., we dare to dream, connecting one with God and one with one another. We teach the Word of God through Connection Group and Wednesday Bible Studies. The Word of God is declared and celebrated each Sunday morning. Through prayer, we build our relationship with God and one another. We proclaim the Word of God locally and globally. The Canaan Christian Church is a great church because we glorify God and seek to spiritually edify the people of God. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, how blessed we are to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Come on, somebody. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. This is certainly the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad therein. We are in midweek of Holy Week. We're on our way to Calvary. Hallelujah. But after Calvary, there's going to be a what? A resurrection. So we want to give God the glory in advance for how we're going to shout and praise and run and give him um, just thoughtful, heartfelt praise on this Sunday coming. But we ain't going to wait till Sunday. Amen. Amen. And we bless God for your presence being here in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. There's a few coming, and as they come, we're going to prepare our hearts for prayer. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we bless you for this time of sharing today. We thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for every person that is here, here in the sanctuary, joining us virtually. God, we give you glory. We thank you, God, that we have a mind to want to know your word, that we have a mind to want to know your will, that we have a mind to want to be in the house with other believers. And so for that, God, we give you glory. We pray for our pastor, even now, God, as he is declaring the word, Lord Jesus, during this week of Holy Week the week of passion. And so God, we pray that you would stand up in him in a mighty way, undergird him even now. And it is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray and let every heart say, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Certainly wanna welcome everyone who has joined us this evening for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Certainly wanna welcome those of you that have joined us virtually. Thank you for always being a part, being committed to the study of God's word. Um, to our, our virtual members and covenant partners, we greet you with the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, as I said in our prayer, our pastor is out of town this week. He is in Texas and he is declaring the word during the entirety of this week. So even as I prayed then, I pray that we pray now and undergird him. He's been back and forth, Las Vegas, Texas. That's a lot of traveling. And then um, in addition to that, he's dealing with grief. Yeah, yeah. You know how sometimes I say we got to jump in the text. Come on, we got to jump in the shoes of somebody else and feel what they're feeling. Amen. So that we can undergird him and lift him up in prayer. So last Wednesday, I, this is a privilege, two Wednesdays back to back. It really is an honor because we can, you know, we can say, do y'all have some homework? Did I give y'all homework? I should have given y'all some homework. <clears throat> but it is a privilege because we're going to continue our study in the first chapter of the book of Colossians. And we started last Wednesday in verses 9 and 10. Um, and actually, I read from verse 1 through 14, but our focal text does start at verse number nine. So I'm gonna read again tonight from verse number nine. And the prayer is that we get to verse number 14. But guess what? If we don't, it's gonna be all right. Because there's a lot here. And so we wanna cover it as thoughtfully and as completely as we can. So let's go ahead and start reading at verse number nine, Colossians chapter one. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, 
so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. As you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins amen amen you know i ought to start at verse 14 and make my way back up to make sure i get it covered um but from last wednesday when we were in verses 9 and 10 um, I'm not going to recover all of the context, but I do want to share a little bit just for those that may not have been this, here this past Wednesday. So just as a point of review, just so that we can be reminded, and for those that were not here, Paul was writing to this church of believers, the church of Colossae, of which, number one, he had never met, and number two, he did not birth this church. And also, he is writing from prison, mm -hmm. encouraging others while he's, yeah, mm -hmm. after having received this report from Epaphras. So he gets a report from Epaphras about what is taking place in Colossae. And what Paul is responding to is the her heretical teaching that is taking place that is not giving the full unadulterated gospel, which we'll see, we're not gonna read it, but if you go back up to verses three and four, and then later when we get to verse number 15, the full expansion of the gospel, which includes that Jesus Christ, which is the theme of the book, Jesus Christ is all sufficient and he is all supreme. We gotta get that early on. We gonna read verses 15 through 20 when we, before we leave. Yes, we are. I want y'all to be prepared. And if you don't understand what I'm saying here, you will once we read these particular verses. But Paul is building up to what is going to be um, this, it's termed high Christology, this description of Jesus Christ. Oh my God. And, and it's a description of the supremacy of Christ, but he's leading us on this journey before we get there. And he's starting with doctrine, because the doctrine that is being taught by some false teachers is incorrect, um, and it's downright um, blasphemous, if you will. Amen. Because what we're teaching tonight um, has to do with what they were talking about then, which has to do with Gnosticism, mixing a little bit of Judaism and a little bit of the law and a little bit of, um, of Christian ethics and teaching and putting it all together and saying, this is what you need. Versus looking at the gospel for what it is and accepting the gospel in its totality that it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to get that the context at that time is that so much other teaching was taking place. But Paul has come to set the record straight. Paul has come to set the record straight. And so he is responding to the report that he has received from Epaphras. Now, I did cover verse 10, but I am going to go back just a little bit um, because verse 9, which is our focal text, is where everything springs from. But then when we look at verse 10, verse 10 then talks to us about the purpose of why we need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in the first place. And one of the things that we talked about last Wednesday is that this filling is a filling of completion. F-I-L-L-I-N-G. I'm filled to completion with the knowledge of God's word. It has to do with being controlled by what you're filled with. Yes, yes, we talked about it a little bit last Wednesday because we can be filled with a whole lot of things. We didn't talk about 
Yes, some things that we can be filled with that cause us to act in a certain way outside of our character, or maybe it bursts out the real character that is really in us. There are things that influence us. I can't stay there. That, that influence us. But Paul is writing to the church and praying that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that they would be influenced by what is going to help them grow, so that they would be influenced by what was going to help them have a closer walk with the Lord. Amen? And it is the knowledge of God's will. We're still in verse 10. But it's the knowledge of God's will with what? All spiritual wisdom and understanding. It's not a soft knowledge. It's not a head knowledge. It is an, a knowledge that comes out of the experience that we have with God. Paul is saying it is this knowledge when we have it with the spiritual wisdom and understanding that then allows us, helps us, persuades us to walk worthy of the Lord. And as we live and as we walk and as we live in a manner that pleases God, right? We ought to be living that way right now. Okay. Were y'all here Sunday? Okay, so who was here last Wednesday? Just, just, just a show of hands. And who was here Sunday? Those that were here last Wednesday and those that were here Sunday, what I'm about to go into, this is the third time y'all heard it. Mm. <laughs> the third time. Y'all remember. And, and I found it so interesting. And did our pastor not teach? Yeah, it was a convicting word. I know. I, I know. I was convicted myself. But it was a real word, and it was an honorable word, and it was a word that should have blessed us. It, it's a word that should have pushed us and others to be in the house on tonight. Amen. Because what we're looking at, as pastor has covered these uh, verses that I covered, he used them as the edifying partial, edifying scriptures for what he taught on Sunday, uh, Colossians 1 verses 9 and 10, when he taught that as the mighty word it was, he was talking about what? Submission. Y'all see how that all works together? He was talking about how we have to be submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I said before, we're getting it for the third time. And what we're trying to hear God speak to our individual hearts is what we need to do to have a closer walk with him to be able to walk out a life, live out a life that is exemplary and an example of the person of Jesus Christ, whom we say we are following. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be living out a life that exemplifies a Christian life. It reflects the character of Jesus. This is a personal word. It was written to this church at Colossae, but the more and more I think about it, Keith, it's real personal. Mm -hmm. Because if we allow the Lord to speak to us, do y'all ever let the Lord speak to you through his word? Can you hear God speaking to you? I heard him. I'm hearing him even now. Daughter, I'm so glad that you received me. I'm so glad that you know me in the pardon of your sins. Daughter, do you know that it's not enough just to come down the aisle and shake the pastor's hand? Daughter, you may be gifted to teach, gifted to preach, gifted to sing, gifted to usher. However, you got to walk it out outside these four walls just as well. Joan, are you growing in your knowledge of me? This is the Lord speaking. Is it beyond head knowledge? Is the relationship that you have with me growing? It's personal. Because if we go back to epinosis, I, I can't go back, I can't go back, but our pastor taught us as well, epinosis, which is beyond the Gnostic teaching about just head knowledge, intellectual knowledge, epinosis is the knowledge that bursts out of a personal relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be wanting to have a more intimate relationship with him, shouldn't we? Because the ultimate aim of right knowledge, which is that epinosis, should be a right or a righteous walk. There ought to be some results of having set on, I mean, we get, Lord have mercy, are we blessed in this house? Every connection group, Bible study group, teaching. Teaching. 
Amen? First Sunday, men's Bible study, women's Bible study, teaching. Sunday and Wednesday after Sunday and Wednesday after Sunday and Wednesday, our pastor pours into us teaching. And he ain't teaching nothing sloppy. This is the word of God. But the Bible says we got to be not only hearers and readers of the word, but we're called to be what? Doers. We got to walk a word out. The spiritual knowledge that we're getting and soaking up is useless if we don't apply it to our lives. So in 1 John 3, 18, it tells us, Dear children, let us not love with words of speech, but with actions and in truth. I read a quote while I was studying that said, what you live is what you really believe. Everything else is religious talk. Yeah, my toes hurt too, right? The, 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 the brother's name was Vance Havner, never heard of him, but this has spoken volumes. It is a sobering statement. What you live is what you believe. Almost Duan goes back to the head, heart, and hands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What we receive in our head through the word of God ought to then prick our heart to a degree that then we live, what did I say? Walk a word out. What does that mean? Maybe that means feed the hungry. What does that mean? What pastor even gave an example of giving someone a ride that lives way across town. Being inconvenienced. But it's such a blessing when we allow the Lord to use us in that manner. But we will get to that in just a minute when we start talking about the bearing fruit of good work. Because the good works is not always about standing up here, singing up here. It's the stuff that other people don't ever see you do. You're not getting a pat on the, black, on the back, right? Nobody's calling you out and giving you a plaque, right? Because you pick someone up for church. That's what we ought to do, right? If we want others to receive the word of God like us. So when we live lives that are worthy of the Lord, then we please him. And that just ought to be our goal. Our goal, as quiet as it's kept, ought to be that we want to please our God. And so we're called to study to show ourselves approved aren't we? But we also got to apply that same word and walk it out. So our walk and our talk should be twins, going down the same trail, road, highway, you pick your poison, together, so that the work that we do then becomes an overflow or an outflow of the life that we live because we are abiding in Christ. That's the only way we can do what God has called us to do. In verse number nine, he's calling us to, Paul is praying that they would live in the knowledge of God's will. But we can't live that out unless we are abiding in him. And of course, if you um, are a student of the Bible, you know John 15, starting around verse number five, that I'm the vine and you are the what? Branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do not a thing, no thing, right? And then if anybody does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. So if you don't stay connected to the vine, you'll die and burn off. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Verse number eight, by this, my father is what? glorified. We want God to get all the glory. By this, my Father, is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. I don't know how many times at a given Sunday as our pastor is preaching that we hear the word disciple or that we are called to be disciples, that God is making us and maturing us into disciples. God is working to produce something out of us which will then bring glory to him out of our lives. So the question has to be asked then, what are we producing? Mm -hmm. What's the fruit of our life that we are producing? And is what's produced out of our lives from him? Because some of us are producing some things, 
but is it something that God has ultimately ordained for us to produce? Because the fruit we want to produce is God fruit. Not Joan fruit, not y'all fruit, <laughs> but God's fruit. And that fruit is produced by the Holy Spirit. You can go over to Galatians for the fruit of the Spirit and all those that are listed. Because again, to bear fruit means to produce something. And one of the things that we did not talk about last Wednesday as far as what is bearing fruit and what can be born or produced from our lives, and that is other believers, new disciples, converts. When we share the love of Jesus Christ, we ought to expect that because of the love that we have for him, the excitement that we exhibit. We keep glossing over that. We keep going by that. We keep passing through that. And we come and God says, I'm so glad you're here. Then we leave. But we don't do a whole lot different from Sunday to Sunday and Wednesday to Wednesday oftentimes. Now, maybe that's not true. Maybe I just need to speak for myself that sometimes we get into a um, spiritual rut, if you will. And we have a call to shake ourselves <laughs> and allow the Holy Spirit to really work through us. Because the ultimate fruit that we could ever produce is another disciple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna say it again for those of y'all getting in the back. <laughs> the ultimate fruit that we could ever produce is another disciple. Pastor says it, doesn't he? He says, um, you've been in a church for however long, how many people have you brought to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's an indictment sometimes. It hurts, doesn't it? But don't we just thank God for another and another and another and another opportunity to do what God has called us to do? Because that's what we're talking about. Do what the Lord said do. We overcomplicate it oftentimes, but God just says, do what I told you to do. So stay connected spiritually to the ultimate vine. We're talking about bearing fruit in every good work. And every good work can be good works of uh, minuscule to maximum, right? We should want to be a do-gooder. I remember when I was young, I was the one. I was the one they called, you just a goody two-shoes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> and yes, sir. Not because I was saved and feared God, but because I feared my dad and I feared my mom, right? <laughs> I was the one, I have a brother, he's two years younger than I am, but I was the one, I'm not getting no whippings. What I got to do to stay out of that train? I, <laughs> I don't want no spankings, whippings, whatever y'all call them. And sometimes it was a shoe. Phew. Sometimes it was an extension cord. Yeah, I learned my, sometimes it was a switch. You know, come on, y'all. We got to go out and pick your own. Not big enough. Go back. Get another one. Right? But I tried to learn my lessons early. But all of us ought to be learning that same lesson in God. Right? And want to bear fruit in every good work. And all the while, as Paul writes, writes while growing. So we don't just come down, I'm here, I'm good, I made it in. I like to hear when Janice uh, Agayo teaches about when she first got saved. She was just happy she made it in, right? She teaches that with conviction. But the reality is that we're called to grow. We're called to grow in our relationship with God. So we got to be honest about ourselves and how we're living and how we're growing or if we're growing, we say, I met the Lord and he did a work in me. That's what we say. And if that is the case, that means that we've heard this before. This is not new. We've been changed. We've been transformed. Pastor often says that a revolution has taken place. We're the army. We're the, we're the army for the revolution. I know Kirk Franklin had a revolution. Where's our revolution? And, and so we get a little quiet, a little pensive on that, but there are some times that, as believers, we gotta rise up. We gotta rise up for what is right and can't sit quietly on the sideline as if we don't know what is going on because we don't wanna get involved. Now, once we confess our hope in him, the reality is that we are never the same again. But we got to continue to grow. We got to continue to grow in grace. And we got to continue to be mindful of when we get to the point where, hey, I'm just going through the motions. 
showed up on Sunday. I went to Connection Group Bible Study. I know my teachers are like, okay. Check. Went to the sanctuary. Had worship. Check. Went home. Watched some TV. Went to bed. Got up. Next morning, went to work. Check. 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 We checking off boxes, but the question is, has there been a change in our heart? The question is, are we allowing God to continue to work on us in the way that he needs to? Amen. And, and I, I know we all got stuff to work on. I, I'm raised my hand first. I got stuff to work on. And uh, it helps to confess. And when we're in the relationship that we ought to have with God, first of all, he already knows. But more importantly, he's there to bring us across that sedentary bridge that we may have been on for the last however many months. He's the one, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that will jolt us out of whatever doldrums that we are in. He's the one that will help us shake ourselves loose and come back to what? Ourselves. But not just ourselves, but the better self that we should be because of verse number nine. Mm. So we're in a constant state of becoming. And I, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to just tell, tell the truth and shame the devil. You know, God is really, he's working, you know, on all of us. But there is just one person. And when I see their face, when I hear their voice, on TV, on the radio, on, I mean, something just goes all through me. And I start wishing things on this individual that as a Christian shouldn't even be thinking. I guess I'm the only one. Because the reality is that no person no thing should ever get me off the moral ground, the Christian ethic highway that I am on. And here's the beauty of it. God knows, and he will help us. And so I have to repent right there. God, Lord Jesus, you, ooh, you, I know you saw the thought, God. Take it, take it. Maybe I'm the only one. So I got to get myself together sometimes, right? Yes, Father, forgive me. Gather my thoughts. Help me, Lord, right where I stand. Because, you know, I got to go to work. I got to get in my car. I got to drive. I'm looking for God to protect me and cover me and get me from point A to point B. But I can't be rolling thinking those type of thoughts. Listen, every good work is any work that glorifies the Father. Yes. Matthew 5, 16 tells us that let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, the goal of the good works is not so we can say, I did some good works. The goal of the good works is so that others can see the good works but give glory to the Father. Because the reality should be that in and of myself, I really wouldn't choose to do those particular good works. I'm not still a goody two-shoes. I've evolved. <laughs> I'm a different kind of woman now. God has to help me. The Holy Spirit has to lead me. Come on, somebody. We got to be honest. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Listen, but gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good. You got money, do good. You ain't got money, do good. That they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Attitude, heart attitude, disposition. It's how we ought to walk this thing out. And we should be so in tune with God, so close to God, have such an intimate relationship with God that when he speaks, you just move. We don't question, right? Well, Lord, you want me to give me that much? <laughs> and, God, you, and here's the beauty. You did hear him. That's the part we don't like. We did hear him. But do we want to question what do we hear? You want me to $50? <laughs> we want to question what the Lord has told us what to do. 
But the blessing is that God desires that we continue to grow in our knowledge, and that is the blessing. That's the reality. And we ought to want to grow in our knowledge of him and his will. And we talked about it, and I already said it earlier, that um, this is an, ex an experiential um, knowledge. It is a relational knowledge. It has to do with a deeper, more intimate level in my communion with him. It's when we can truly say, I have history with God. Oh my goodness. I shouldn't even stop right there, Keith. Because this past Sunday, didn't we talk about the stairway? Didn't we talk about spiritual markers? Uh, didn't we talk about, I know y'all's classes were lit up. I know they were, because I walked through and I could hear y'all in there. Look, some of y'all are bootleg teachers, by the way. So. I'm coming for y'all because I see you and I hear you. Because, and what we're teaching from a place of experience, that's the epignosis. We're teaching from a place of what God has done for me. And nobody can take that away. I know that I know that I know. If it had not been, if he didn't move in, if he didn't make a... So we're, te we're teaching, we're declaring, we're giving a testimony of what God has done and what only God could have done. I have history with God. Oh, if we had just a little bit more time, I could tell a few stories. Hallelujah. And they're not to convince you, but they're to edify and then to glorify God. Because when we start thinking about all God has done for us, when, you know, when they sing the song, all of the ways you've made, all the, the ways you've kept me, all of those things that we start talking about, the needs and the wants that he's provided for us, the fact that I just said a minute ago, when you hear God, you know and discern his voice, the God of all creation, the God of majesty, the God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who is coming back for a church without spot or ring, that God speaks, and still he speaks from eternity. It's a beautiful thing, hallelujah, when we can say that he what? Walks with me, he talks with me, and he tells me, I'm his, uh, and the joy we share as we do what? Tarry there. None other has ever, no, you're not going to ever have that type of experience with nobody else. Oh, my God, I thank you. I thank you. We got to move on. We got to move on to verse number 11. Well, this is the first new verse. Oh, Jesus, it's 732. Let's go. So last week, we talked about the fact that verses 9 through 14 in reality, depending on the translation that you have and that you're reading and studying from, the reality is that verses 9 through 14 is one long sentence. And even our pastor said it this past Sunday that these, these epistles were letters, but they've been broken down into chapters and to verses. But here, when we read in certain translations, it helps us to be able to what? To receive and to understand and to take in all the fullness of what Paul is teaching. This thought that, or I should say thoughts that Paul is having, it's one long thought that's leading us to the supremacy of Jesus the Christ. You have to read it all to be able to really take that in. But in verses 11 and 12 here, we have Paul's emphasis, which is on Christian character. Mm-hmm. And so but what I want to do here first, though, because there's some character traits, we're just going to look at a few character traits um, that are in verses 11 through 12. We got patience. We got long-suffering. We've got joyfulness and we have thanksgiving. Those are the ones that are um, highlighted, if you will, in this text. Now, again, like I said, depending on the translation that you're reading, it may read a little bit differently. I study from the New Revised Standard Version, but I'm also keenly aware that um, we use, our pastor uses, and so when the verses come up on the screen, um, we are referencing the New King James Version. Almost both of them put together create a beautiful picture of verses 11 and 12. Let me read it from the New Revised Standard Version first. This is verses 11 and 12. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power so that you may have all endurance and patience 
joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. That's enough to make you want to run. New King James Version, this is how it reads. And so when you come out of it, it's not a full sentence, so it sounds just a little bit different. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us whew, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So let's just look at a few of these words and we'll just see how far we get. First of all, the word strengthen. May you be made strong with all the strength or may you be strengthened. Strengthen means to be enabled and speaks of an inherent power, mm -hmm, which gives one the ability to do something, to strengthen, to be strong, to endure. It comes from the Greek word dunamu, which is from the root dunamai, which gives us the word we get dunamis for what? Power. It's the strength that Paul spoke of in his letter to the church at Philippi. In Philippians 4 and 1, he said, I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. And that strengthening, whether it be here in Colossians or it be in Philippians, Philippians is a continual strengthening in the life of a believer. And it's always and ever at our disposal. <laughs> we always have access. Okay. Okay, that's, that's good news. So for whoever didn't know, you have access. I remember back in the day, oh, thank you, Lord because I wanted to say it, but I didn't write it down, and y'all know if I don't write it down, it's never going to get said. But he brought it back to my remembrance. Thank you. Back in the day, college days, y'all remember that song? I got the power. Man, we would flock out to the dance floor, happy about the power. What power? <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> Where are you going? Power to do what? Power to dance longer? Power to drink another drink? What kind of power you got? But we love the song, right? But the beautiful part about Paul is that the power that we're talking about is the glorious power. It's the glorious power that comes from God. It's the manifested power. And it's available to us as believers. It's available to us as believers as we become filled with the knowledge of God's word and its will. It is continuous and it is sufficient. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of repetition. It's almost cyclical, right? Because Paul is focused on what he's sharing. He's trying to make sure that the, Coloss the Colossian believers and the Colossian church understands what you're being taught right now is not right. And so I want you to know that the way that you continue to grow is you got to stay in his word. The way that you're able to walk worthy is you got to stay in his word. And that's the, don't we, ain't that what we doing? Staying, abiding in his word. Now we talked about the all sufficiency of Christ last week. And when you go a little bit further in that same chapter 4 of Philippians, then we read that my God shall supply what? All your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. All means all. And I know oftentimes we go directly to um, clothes, food, shelter, right? Those are needs. I'm good with that. But... They should also include whatever we lack in spiritual resources. Mm-hmm. Whatever we need, God will supply. We just need only what? Ask. And here's the beautiful part about it. His supply is limitless. What he blesses me in faith to have in the form of spiritual blessings does not diminish anything that he's going to give to my brother or my sister. My God, who supplies all, and he can supply my all, your all, and the whole world's all. And here's the other thing about it. When we come to God earnestly, 
seeking him, desiring to be closer to him, just a closer walk with thee, right? Granted, Jesus, if you please, daily, come on. When we come to God like that, you think God's going to, like, not respond? He's just looking for us to come to him like that. We're on strength, we're on strength, right? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. It reads, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For what my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul goes on to say in verse, in, in verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. When's the last time you prayed that? When's the last time you said that? Did we ever think that? But Paul says, therefore, based on what I just read, that my strength is made perfect in weakness, that I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. Why? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a win-win situation. <laughs> because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why? Because I'm not relying on myself. Why? Because I'm leaning. Why? Because I'm depending. Why? Because I'm trusting. Why? Because I know God's got me. And when you know God's got me, it don't matter how you feel. It don't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what's coming against you or I. It doesn't matter that I've got a limp and it's visible. Or I got a limp, but you can't see it. <laughs> but God says, I got you. So I'm strengthened by might, not my might. I'm strengthened by power, not my power. I'm strengthened by the spirit of the Lord. And so I decrease, I die daily, so what? That the power of Christ can live, abide, and dwell in me. It can't be what Joan wants. This is what I won't do, which is sometimes how we go to God. We have to be honest. God's not interested in our lists. I love that even this, it, it, it goes well with what Pastor reminds us, is that we pray from victory, not for victory. We've already got the victory. So when I'm living in this manner of walking worthy and I'm bearing fruit in every good work, I'm dying daily so that the power of Christ can dwell in me. It's not my will, but thy will be done in me. Then I become a witness. Then I become a living example and a testimony of what God has done, is doing, and shall do in my life. God is able. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think we need to remind ourselves of that. And the Lord knows when we experience God, that epinosis, in such a profound way, then our testimony has to be that God did it. If we say anything less than that, we've missed the mark. God did it. God kept me in it. God blessed me through it. God used, remember, I don't remember the pastor's name a couple of Sundays ago. He used the it to strengthen me to edify the people of God and give God the glory. Remember, the purpose of the power is to live a life that is worthy. That's the purpose of the power, to live a life that is worthy, to walk a life out that is worthy, fully pleasing him. And we need his power to be able to do that. We cannot do it in and of our own strength. We don't have the power. We don't have the will. We don't have the capacity. We're not smart enough. We don't have enough money. Whatever God has called us to, to do, he has to equip us to be able to do that. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us to live in a manner because our willpower is not enough. Our, will, our willpower, I promise, is not enough. We don't have enough will in and of ourselves to carry out what God has called us to do. Listen, we, some, we ain't got enough willpower just to not stop at McDonald's. 
Come on, somebody. I started doing the green smoothie cleanse again. Brother Dow. <laughs> but you know what? But I, this time, and I started this week. It's Passion Week, y'all. Come on. And, and in doing so, though, there has to be an element of prayer that goes along with whatever it is that we're asking God to help us to do. I don't care if you're trying to get your finances straight. I don't care if you're trying to lose a few pounds. I don't care, whatever it is, if God is not a part of the mix and we're not praying and asking him to help us, asking him to empower us, then we're setting ourselves up oftentimes to do what? Fail. It's non-sustainable without the power of the Lord helping us. And at the end of the day, y'all, we don't know what we're going to have to face. This life is filled with swift transitions, right? Whether that be health issues, whether that be challenges at work, loss, death, whatever it is. Whether it is you're driving on the Baltimore Bridge at 1.30 in the morning. You driving a truck, you just doing your job, and now you're hanging over the Ohio River. Come on, y'all. We take so much for granted oftentimes. And then in the blink of an eye, everything can change. But Paul says, no matter what we have to face, no matter what we have to contend with, the strength that we need is the strength that we have access to. It's that glorious manifested power. And it is what will prepare us to endure. I love that part, to endure. So first there is enduring, but there's also long suffering. I want to give you these two, and then I'm probably going to have to stop. Because it is in the New King James Version where we see the, the words patience and long suffering. So I want you to see what they mean. Long-suffering means having or showing patience in spite of troubles, especially those caused by other people. So you got to look words up. You got to look, look them up. Long-suffering. It's not necessarily circumstances, but it's you. <laughs> or it could be me, right? I'm the issue, right? I've caused some angst. So this word long-suffering comes from two Greek words that mean long and tempered. So here we're talking about a person that's able to show restraint in the face of being um, ridiculed, uh, talked about, harmed, frustrated, right? But they show restraint even though they want to be what? Angry. Even though they want to say something to you. Yeah. They want to choke you out. But they're restrained. See, some of us have just been saved and we don't even know. We were saved because the Holy Spirit stepped in when we were mouthing off and saying something we didn't have no business saying. We, we took it to the left. Come on, y'all. But God, who is rich in grace and mercy, I can't, I can't. So the opposite would be somebody that is short-tempered. <laughs> or sometimes we say they have a short fuse. Man, they always popping off. They always starting some ish, <laughs> right? And then we have the word endurance. Now, endurance is not just a grin and bear it type of attitude. No, no, no. It's the ability to bear things. Listen. But the ability in bearing them turn them into glory. The ability to bear something turns that something into glory. It's a conquering patience. I like that. It's not mine, but I like it. It's mine now, though. <laughs> It's a conquering, overcoming endurance. That's mine. Conquering and overcoming. It's the ability to deal with something triumphantly. Anything that life can throw at us. We are able to handle it. We don't have to shrink because of it. Because God has equipped us and God has caused us to be prepared to endure, my Bible says, everything. But there's a way that we endure it. We endure it with patience. Listen, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father. I'm going to stop right here. So what is Paul saying? He's saying when you are going through, you see God in the midst. You understand that even if 
um, you can't see him, you know he's there. Even if you can't feel him, you know he's got your back. Even if the sky is black, you can't see your way forward, you understand, God, if you allow this to happen, then you're going to equip me to be able to come through it. You're going to cause a, an open door to, yes, that some kind of way you're going to work a thing out. We're going to walk it out, he's going to work it out. Oh, God, that was good. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's what Paul is saying. If you, work, if you walk it out, he'll work it out. And when I say work it out, that doesn't mean that everything's going to turn around to your favor. That don't mean I'm going to get everything that my little heart desires. What that means to the end that God says, this is how it's going to be. Th that, that whatever takes place, everything ain't good, but it's going to work for my good. I ain't going to like it all. But even though I don't like it, I can have joy. I can have joy in the midst of what's taking place in my life because God is on my side. Because I already know I'm walking in his will. I know I'm walking in his will because I'm in his word. And since I'm in his word, I'm walking in his will. Now I'm going to just give him some praise. And I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know when the fight is going to stop. But what I do know is that soon and very soon, he's going to cause something to rise up. Come on, somebody. Anybody in a fight? Anybody going, having somebody come against you? Y'all too quiet. That's why we got to be thankful. I thank you, Lord, that you even allowed me to come into this thing because you trust me with it. And you know I ain't going to mess it up. And you know at the end there's going to be a testimony. And you know at the end of the day I'm going to give you glory. And you know I'm going to give you the credit for what only you and you alone were able to do. That's an everyday walk, not just the inside the church walls walk. You walk it out, he'll work it out. Woo, I like it. I like it. Walk it out. Hallelujah. That's my time. Oh, Jesus. Yes, that's my time. If I keep going, I'll be late. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give God some glory. Mm. Man, this, this is so rich. This is so rich. Now, listen, I am done, but... Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. So if we go down to, I just want to read these verses again. I want to read them and I want them to get into our spirit. Verses 13 and 14. Because we got to know that we've been rescued. We got to know that we've been delivered. We've got to know that we've been literally plucked from the edge of the devil's hell. We got to understand that we were living in the darkness what is Tommy Jones' song? Uh, brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light. Look where he brought me from, right? So verse number 13, he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us. Some translations say translated us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Holly, so, I'm going to read it again. Because sometimes we miss, see, we so, we've been saved for so long. Yeah. Well, we still sin. <laughs> but we've been saved for so long. I'm in now. I'm in the kingdom. But God has called us to something, and Paul is writing to remind and to teach uh, the believers at Colossae that they have been bought with a price. And you've been delivered, that good news that he talks about in verses 3 and 4, the gospel that was delivered to them that they received. Then the result of that is that he has rescued us. And listen, it wasn't just from darkness, but the power of darkness. Do you know how bad the enemy wanted your soul? Okay, I, I, do we understand that it, this, this much, save Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, who wooed us. The Holy Spirit was working in us before we had the Holy Spirit. I hope you know that. He was wooing us before we even knew what a woo was. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus. And he called us to himself, and we said yes. And because of that, we've now been delivered. We've now been rescued and now transferred us into his kingdom. Because there is a kingdom of darkness. 
but we don't live there no more. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. Give God some praise in here. I'm just excited about Jesus. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited about Jesus. Um, let's go ahead and open up the, the church. Um, there may be somebody here tonight that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins. And if that be the case, we invite you to come. Whether you're in the sanctuary or you're joining us through our virtual platforms, we welcome you. A Wednesday night is a good night to become a member of the body of Christ first and the Canaan Christian Church second. Amen? Anybody in the sanctuary? Anybody in the sanctuary? If there are those of you that are joining us on our virtual platform, please just follow the, um, the screen and fill out the form. There is a form that will just give us some basic information. That form will go to our church office and <clears throat> someone will get with you very quickly to pray with you, whether you're joining by um, Christian experience or rededication, we welcome you into the body of Christ. We welcome you to the Canaan Christian Church. I'm excited, believing, and trusting that somebody said yes. So, that's the part where we get excited, right? Somebody said yes. Hallelujah. And somebody is starting a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. It is now time to give. Amen. Hallelujah. Canaan is a simple church with a, a kingdom focus, and we follow practical stewardship giving. There are five ways to give. You'll see there on the screen, cash check, website, mobile app, or text. And certainly if you were not here this past Sunday, Palm Sunday, we encourage you to um, drop your giving off in the buckets as you leave the sanctuary. Amen? Amen. And those of you that are worshiping with us through um, our virtual platforms, <clears throat> you can follow the same form. And then also those of you that need to mail in your giving, the address is on the screen, 2840 Hikes Lane, Louisville, Kentucky, 40218. Amen? Amen. Well, if all minds are clear. Mm, yes, thank you, Keith. We want to, first of all, be prayerful for our pastor. And then remember that we have our Good Friday service this Friday at 12 noon. Pastor Brian Byron, excuse me, Cox of the Highland Park Missionary Baptist Church will be our guest preacher. And then we also, as we close out in prayer, we want to um, keep in our prayers Barbara Bowler, her sister, Reverend Blanche, Blanche Luter was a charter member of the Canaan Christian Church and she passed. And then Ella Shepherd, her brother has passed as well. So we wanna keep all these things um, in our hearts and in our minds as we pray for these fellow believers, amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we thank you. Oh God, we bless you. We thank you, God, for our salvation. We thank you, God, for our deliverance out of the kingdom of darkness. We thank you, God, that your word is true. We thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit continues to work in and through us. And we bless you, God, for our open hearts to want to receive your word, to be able to walk your word out so that we could be a witness and a testimony to those that do not know you. Help us, God, to be honest about where we are. Help us, God, to be honest about our relationship with you. Help us, God, to want to be closer to you, have a more intimate walk with you. And then, God, help us to walk worthy. Help us, God, to want to please you in everything that we do. We just want to bring you glory and bring you honor. And then, God, as we prepare to come on this Sunday, help us, Lord, to witness, to share the love of Jesus Christ with those that do not know you, and then invite them, and then bring them. Help us, Lord, to be that faithful believer, that faithful Christian who will do what you've told us to do and be obedient to your word. Lord, we just want to be a Christian in our hearts. Help us now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray and we give you the thanks. And let every heart say, amen. Amen. We thank you for worshiping with us today. Canaan Christian Church, a church.